Hey, everybody. Welcome back. We're having another Thursday Night Live at Home with Olympus. We're super happy that you could join us tonight. I'm seeing already from the comment section that we have people from all over the world joining us again. Um, we're super happy to be able to have this connection to all of you guys and provide you with this awesome education every other Thursday night. So thank you again for joining us. Um, tonight is gonna be super cool. However, I do want to start off with a little disclaimer that the second half of this presentation is going to be best viewed on an actual monitor versus um, watching on a mobile device or a phone. A bigger screen will help. Um, we have a special guest, Peter Baumgarten, with us. He is going to be talking a lot about shooting the stars and uh, some of his post-processing techniques. And then we are going to attempt a live editing uh, session at the second half. Now, if we run into bandwidth issues, bear with us. We are live streaming, remember that. And we have a backup plan if it doesn't pan out for us, so don't get too mad. We will keep it rolling and we will help you learn how to get better star photos. Uh, also worth noting, we just added another event for two weeks from now on May 6th at 5 p.m. Eastern. We are actually going to do a live photo critique with Peter Baumgarten on your astro landscape. So if you've been shooting this year or you learned something from this session and you want to go try it, you should. Um, we will add the link in the comments for that session in just a little bit so that you can submit your photos as well. And then maybe they will make it on the show next time around. Uh, let's bring on Peter, right? You guys have had enough of me. Let's bring on Peter. Welcome, Peter. Hey, how are you, Michelle? I'm good. How's the weather up there? Uh, today is actually pretty nice. Yeah, we've had a, a, a very early spring. Um, we've had some really nice April weather. So yeah, no complaints. Oh, that's nice. Uh, I always picture it being really cold where you are because I see all your photos and they're very beautiful, but they look chilly. Well, compared to where you live, it is cold. <laughs> Yeah, I pay for that sunshine tax, right? <laughs> so what subjects do you think you're going to cover tonight before we get into the live editing? Um, so I'm really excited to be covering astro landscape photography. I'm, you know, first and foremost, a landscape photographer, but I've kind of migrated to uh, working at night. And yeah, so lots to share on that. Awesome. Well, I'm going to get out of your way. If you want to bring up your slideshow, I'll pop it up on the screen for everyone. And as always, we have uh, some help helping out in the comment section. We'll try to get your answers. If we don't get to them right away, we will get them answered in a timely fashion. And then at the very end tonight, we will do a Q&A session, okay? So save your burning questions for Peter towards the end, and we'll get those popped up on the screen and try to get some answers out of him, okay? All right. See you guys soon and enjoy the show, Peter. All right. Well, I hope to enjoy it. Um, so thanks, Michelle, for the introduction. Thanks for the invitation to actually be a part of Home with Olympus. Thanks to everybody who's tuning in from all over the world. And I also want to throw out a special thanks to my good buddy and fellow visionary, Frank Smith, for doing an awesome presentation a couple of weeks ago. I'm going to be making reference to that presentation and then build on some of what he talked about. If you missed his presentation, I strongly encourage you to go back into the archives um, and view that because there was some really cool information in there. Uh, but now I'm going to turn to what I want to talk about tonight. Now, one of the things that uh, Frank um, was talking about with regards to night sky photography is that there are a variety of subjects that you can photograph at night, um, including uh, cityscapes, star trails, uh, photographing the moon, right? the aurora, fireworks. These are all awesome things to photograph at night, and I'm not going to talk about any of them. Certainly not those particular subjects. For me, when I'm going out at, to shoot, and I know this applies to many astral landscape photographers, we're looking for one particular feature of the night sky, and that's UFO, no, not UFOs, um, the Milky Way, right? And so tonight's presentation can apply to all sorts of night sky shooting scenarios, but it's mainly based on the Milky Way. And when I first started shooting at night, maybe six, seven years ago, um, it became obvious really quickly 
how little I understood the night sky, or in other words, uh, where the heck is the Milky Way? When I first began, I thought that winter would be an awesome time to actually go out and shoot. Where I live, the winter nights are pretty long, um, and certainly you can photograph the night sky uh, during the winter, but if you're looking for the Milky Way, you'll be very disappointed because in the winter, Although you can kind of see a trace of the Milky Way, the most important part, the cool part, the core, is not visible. Because of the tilt of the Earth on its axis, it's below the horizon. But wait a couple of months, we head into spring where we are now, and the magic reappears. And so the Milky Way rises in the east, uh, forming this beautiful arc uh, that I absolutely love to photograph at this time of the year. The core of the Milky Way, though, is more towards the southeast. And you can see it just rising here in this photograph. As it rises higher into the sky and as the months go on, it actually begins to migrate a little farther to the south. Now, the important thing in this image is to notice the timestamp. So I photographed this in March, so about a month ago but it was at five in the morning or just before five in the morning. Um, if I'd gone out the night before, so let's say 10, 11 o'clock at night, I would have been disappointed because it hadn't come up yet. Just like the sun and the moon, you know, come up at specific times. Well, so does the Milky Way, but that does change as the months go on. So if we move ahead into late spring, early summer, now we get what's called a typical orientation and you can still see the arc but it is now much higher in the sky and you don't have to go out early in the morning, which I know a lot of people don't like to do. You can stay up later at night. Um, the arc is a little harder to photograph in its entirety. Even as a panorama, it can be a challenge in May and June. All right, head into late summer and fall. And now the Milky Way looks like uh, it has a vertical orientation. It's almost straight up because it would have risen while the sun was still up, all right? So the first part of planning any kind of astro shoot, if you want to include the Milky Way in your shot, um, is to know where and when it will appear. And we are at sort of the perfect time of the year for it. This is my favorite time, and that's kind of why I'm excited to be doing this right now, all right? The other planning considerations all involve trying to escape the light, right? We want to go to the dark side. Um, and there is a lot of light that we need to fight against that, you know, we don't want hitting our sensor. And the first type of light is daylight, right? We, of course, need to get out there when um, it is nighttime. And so when is night? Well, um, it's not right after the sun has set we have this transition period, you know, the twilight zone, and we need to make sure that we are beginning to shoot after astronomical twilight, which is sort of at that border between uh, a little bit of the blue hour still and when it is as dark as it's going to get. And so for astronomers, night is that period where it's as dark as it's going to get. And so here's just an example of where I live for today. So I live at a, almost exactly 45 degrees north, all right? That's my latitude. And so today, the sun is going to set at 824. Um, but I'm going to have to wait a fair amount of time still before we get to official night. Nighttime actually begins at 1020 or 18 minutes after 10. So that's almost a two hour wait that I have to uh, perform there before I get that. And then it'll be night for uh, quite a few hours until 4.30 in the morning, and then it's going to start getting light again. And so right now, I've got just over six hours of good nighttime shooting. But of course, if you are at a different latitude, that's going to change. And as time goes on, that changes. So just as a point of comparison, um, if we fast forward to the summer solstice, longest day of the year is also the shortest night of the year. I've only got two and a half hours of shooting where I am. If you're farther south, well, you'll have more. If you're farther north, you'll have less. And if you're you know, a little too far north, you won't have any night at all, right? The land of the midnight sun. Um, so that's another planning consideration, you know, getting out there when it is as dark as possible, all right? The next form of light that we are fighting against is again cyclical in nature, and that's moonlight. And so I regularly go to this website, timeanddate.com, to figure out when uh, the moon is going to be out. We are 
obviously want to be uh, there during the new moon. And so this month, the new moon was on the 11th, but that's not the only night that you can go out and shoot. Thank goodness, there'd only be 12 nights a year. Uh, that'd be pretty slim pickings. Uh, there is about a two week window in which you can go out and shoot if you keep in mind when the moon is rising and when the moon is setting, all right? And so for today, unfortunately, we're kind of at the end of that window for this month. You might remember from the previous slide that twilight begins, for me anyway, um, at around 4.30 in the morning, and the moon is just setting at around that time. And so um, we're kind of at the end of uh, the period of time this month when you won't have to deal with moonlight. Um, and so, you know, now I'm going to shift my shooting if you know if i've got clear skies to actually photographing the moon but there's still a pretty good window every month all right the next thing that i want to look at um is the weather right you know having good timing for the moon and the uh, milky way and so on doesn't matter if you can't actually see it because you've got clouds and so on your local forecast can kind of help you figure out when to go out and shoot, but there's definitely not enough information, even on most uh, web-based weather forecasters, you know, like uh, the Weather Network or the Weather Channel or something like that. So I use this website, clearoutside.com. It is absolutely phenomenal. Um, it has every weather metric you could possibly imagine. So there's a lot of stuff to go through here, and I'm only, I'm not gonna go through almost any of it, Key thing here is green is good. Where you see green, that means those are optimal conditions. When it comes to the cloud cover, which are the four blue bars that you see in the middle, you want the number zero showing up. Um, a little bit of cloud is okay, but primarily you want nice clear skies. Let me zoom in here a little bit more um, and talk about some other things that are on here that you might find beneficial. Number one, here are those twilight zones. Now this is a screenshot, so I'm not live on the web here uh, on this site, but if I hovered my mouse over that, you'd actually see the exact times of when darkness, nighttime would actually fall. You also see a graphic representation of when the moon will be out. You've also got the specific times of moonrise and moonset. All right, and so on this particular night when I took this screenshot, I had five full hours of shooting, and that's a pretty nice window of opportunity there, right? Um, so I highly recommend that you go to this site, but it also has one other bit of information that unless you were already a bit knowledgeable about astro shooting, you probably have never heard this term before, but the town that I live in, Manitowoning, um, is in a class four bortle. Well, what the heck is a Bortle? Uh, such a strange word. Well, it's named after a guy who came up with a classification system for dark skies. And it goes from one to nine. One being the absolute darkest you could get on the planet and nine being downtown, New York, London, Toronto, uh, major cities. Now, um, we definitely want to avoid, you know, the, the higher numbers. Um, Ideally, you want to be in a situation where you're in a, a class one to four, but in reality, uh, class one hardly exists anywhere on the planet that's accessible, and class four, eh, you can get some results, but there may not be the best, so I'm always looking for class two and three Bortle situations, and that can become very uh, beneficial to know if you're planning a trip. So um, most of you would be familiar with dark sky maps. Frank talked about them uh, yesterday. This is darksightfinder.com. You can find all sorts of maps mm -hmm. like this on the internet. Um, and uh, so I happen to be fortunate that I live in a pocket here of uh, dark sky. I'm going to just zoom in a little bit here. So there's Toronto. I live in Canada. Um, and I live right there um, on Manitoulin Island, which is considered a dark sky area. And I find these maps a little misleading if you've never used them before. You definitely want to avoid oranges and uh, red areas and yellow, but the green and the blue, go for it. You can still get some pretty good results in the green and the blue areas. Gray would be better if you can find spots like that. All right, so back to this. Uh, so I live in a class four Bortle. But five minutes down the road, I'm in class two. So the nice thing about this, if again, if you're planning a trip, 
plunk the coordinates in for where you plan on shooting, not where you're going to stay, not the Airbnb or the hotel that you're staying in, but where you actually plan on shooting and look for areas that are class two or class three. Um, and you know, you're almost guaranteed to get some decent night sky shots. All right. Um, it also comes in a mobile app, which I use when I travel, and I hope to travel again one day, but I'm not doing any of that right now. And while I'm talking apps, there are several that are great for uh, astrophotography, but truly the only one that I really ever use is PhotoPills. This is a screenshot of that, and a lot of landscape photographers already use it to figure out where the moon and sun are going to uh, rise and set uh, for your landscape shooting. But if you slide that time scale into... Uh, night, then the Milky Way appears and you can see where the Milky Way will rise and set and its orientation. And so that can be really useful. It also has a really cool augmented reality feature. Um, and so here's a screenshot. This is shot right outside my front door. So I live near the water. Um, and if you are scouting out an area during the day, you can see where the Milky Way will appear at night. And so I took this screenshot March 23rd, and it would show me that at 5.05 .05 in the morning, that's where the Milky Way would be. So it's a really cool feature of this app. All right. Um, now, I want to get a little technical. Frank did a great job on gear and settings, but I think if you're get it, just getting into astrophotography, this is good information to review. And I have found that this is the intimidating part of... Um, astro shooting. And I want to put your mind at ease. There is no reason to be intimidated by the gear or the settings, because here's a little secret. Um, once you know what those settings are, they never change or they very rarely change. You just have to figure out what settings will work and then you're good to go for almost every situation. And so in a way, what that means is that astrophotography is the easiest form of photography. Um, there are other forms that I find far more challenging than figuring out what settings to use for Astro. All right, let's get into the gear. Well, of course, I'm an Olympus shooter, so I use the EM1 Mark III. Um, and these are the lenses that I carry with me. If I'm going out at night, those four lenses are in my pack. My favorite of those four is the 12 millimeter. It's got a nice balance between field of view and speed. Um, although I have to admit that at this time of the year, with the Milky Way forming this nice arc, I do tend to use the eight millimeter fisheye a fair amount as well. I use them all, but those are the two that I probably use the most. As far as other gear goes, definitely carrying around a headlamp. I make sure it's fully charged when I'm out. Flashlight will work in a pinch as well. You, If you're out with a group of people, it's kind of nice to have one that'll glow red so that you're not interfering too much with theirs. Um, I do a lot of low-level lighting now, which I'm going to talk about, so I pack along a few extra lights. Um, definitely want a good solid tripod, and I want to avoid camera shakes, so I'm going to use a cable release. I don't use the app to trigger it, although that will work. And quite honestly, I often don't even use the cable release because I use a delay timer sometimes with a lot of my shooting. But there's my gear. I don't use anything else, nothing else special. I don't use a tracker. I don't use any special filters to filter out uh, light pollution. Um, I don't use a Batonov mask. This is it. I'm a landscape photographer who likes shooting in the dark sometimes. All right. As far as the settings go, really quickly want to go through this. Manual is absolutely the best mode to be shooting in. The priority modes just aren't going to cut it, and you don't want to be using any of the auto modes. Ideally, you want to be shooting in RAW. You can shoot in JPEGs, and you will get results, but if you're a JPEG shooter, try shooting JPEG and RAW. And when you've made the shift to RAW, you'll have those that you can use to post-process because you get a lot more latitude with those, all right? Focusing is one of those things that can be a challenge, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time on that in a minute. Um, you want to be manual, and you want to be um, set at infinity, all right? If you're shooting raw, you don't need to set a white balance. You can just use auto white balance, but an auto white balance is gonna be particularly warm, unnaturally so, very orangey uh, sky. Uh, so I set a custom white balance in the super control panel, really easy to do, um, usually 36 to 3800, somewhere in there. And again, I can adjust that 
in post if I wish to, right? If you don't want to deal with noise, go noise reduction on and let that run. It's going to double the length of your exposure. So 30 seconds becomes a minute, but it's worth it. All right, let's look at the exposure triangle. Shutter speed. If it's too short, you're not going to gather enough light, but we can't control the uh, rotation of the planet. So if it's too long, um, you're going to start getting star trails. I didn't realize how quickly the planet rotates until I actually started shooting this a few years ago. It moves. Um, and so I use the 400 rule. There are other numbers that you can use, and there are other ways of figuring out your shutter speed, but I like the number 400, especially with newer, better sensors that are out there. And so what that rules dictates is that you take the true uh, focal length of your um, lens divided into the number 400, and that gives you the maximum number of seconds that you can use before you get star trails. So as a quick example, I told you I like using the 12 millimeter. Olympus has a two times crop factor, so I'm gonna multiply that by two, and I get the number 24. So I take that 24, I divide it into 400, and I get 16.6. .6. That's not an option, so I'm gonna round down. I'm not gonna round up. Um, and so I'm gonna to go to 15 seconds, and you're gonna see that number a lot when I'm shooting with that uh, lens. 15 seconds is the maximum shutter speed that I use. All right, aperture, easy, wide open. Our lenses are so good, we don't need to stop them down. Um, I don't, uh, so um, you wanna stick to F2.8 or greater, all right? Uh, a kit lens can work, but that is gonna limit the light that comes in, and so you may end up having to shoot with a higher ISO than you normally might want to. All right, as far as ISO, I would start at 1600 if you're just getting into it. But again, if you've got a newer camera, um, the Mark, twos or Mark III cameras, the either EM, any of the later uh, versions of our cameras, you can get away with ISO 3200, no problem at all. All right. Um, and then of course, when you've got all of those set in, if you plan on doing a whole bunch of it, program it into one of your custom modes. I know that for me, I can both uh, mode uh, custom mode three and four are set for Astro because I do a fair amount of it. And so once I know what these settings are, they really don't change, all right? So I know the instant I put on my fisheye lens, I'm gonna shoot at 25 seconds at 1.8. I don't even have to think about it anymore. I don't have to do the calculations. I've done them once, they're in my memory. With the seven to 14, same thing. I could probably get away with 30, but I round down to 25 at f2.8. I keep it wide open. For the 12 millimeter, 15 seconds at f2, all right? And with the 17, 10 seconds, because that's a much narrower field of view, all right? I didn't put ISO here because that is the one setting that there is a bit of flexibility in. But typically I start at 3200 these days and there are times, especially with the seven to 14, cause there is a full stop difference between any of these other ones, at least a full stop. I often will shoot that at 6400. All right, let's move on. All right, I only wanna focus on one of those settings because I noticed in the last presentation, there were a lot of questions about focusing and you can definitely see that I missed the focusing on this shot. Um, I would typically use the, uh, before the EM1 Mark III came around, I was using the um, manual focus assist features and I would nail the focus 95% of the times, but there were times like in this case, where something went wrong, I don't know what it was, maybe I accidentally bumped the uh, focusing ring and I shot for hours and every single shot came back blurry or soft um, and you don't want that. So if you're not shooting with the EM1 Mark III, definitely engage the manual, of fo uh, manual focus assist features, right? Go to the menu, A4, there they are, and turn on both the magnify and the peaking and that will allow you to more accurately focus because you cannot use the autofocus on those cameras. It is too dark, the cameras can't see the stars um, and autofocus on them. But again, you can get really good results. I certainly did that for years, but now I'm using the EM1 Mark III and that's got that really cool starry sky AF. So I just go into the super control panel, 
I engage the Starry Sky AF. There it is. It's with all the other uh, shooting modes there, focusing modes. All right. The other thing that you're going to want to make sure is that you also select a fairly large target, a fairly large autofocus target, and that it's positioned somewhere where there are stars, certainly not in the foreground, right? So up top center or left or right, depending on what your composition is. Um, and so I usually use the five by five when I'm doing that. And so once I've set that, I then use the A-E-L-A-F-L button, basically the back focus button, um, and then this is what shows up. Starry Sky AF is running. And I also see the little icon there of the uh, Starry Sky AF, so I know that things are working. And if you look closely, you can actually see it beginning to focus. You can see them get blurry and then sharpen up. Um, that takes five or six seconds. It doesn't matter whether you choose the speed, or the accuracy, they both work really well. I'm always on a tripod, so I've used them both. I've gotten perfect results with both. Once it's actually locked in, that autofocus target blinks and you'll hear a beep. If you don't see that blink or you don't hear that beep, it didn't focus. It works very well, but there are times where it can't get the focus for some reason, and so you may have to do it again. Make sure you hear the beep and see it blink. All right. And then you get, you know, perfectly in focus stars and you only have to do that once. You don't have to do that with every shot. I've had I've shot for hours and only focused one time. If I'm switching lenses or I've turned off the camera cuz I'm moving locations, then I'll do it again. All right. So that's the only really technical thing that I want to talk about with regards to camera settings. Um, if you happen to have the 8 mm fisheye uh, here's a little trick. Uh, somebody from Olympus showed me this trick a few years ago, and it works no matter what camera you have. Because the 8mm fisheye doesn't have a clutch, it's a focus by wire system, the instant you turn it on, the lens resets itself to infinity as long as you are using, as long as your camera's been set to one of those autofocus modes. So if I'm using one of the other cameras, so I'm often shooting with the EM5 Mark III at night as well. Um, I just make sure that I am in one of the autofocus modes, like SAF, and right when I turn the camera on, it will automatically um, reset itself to infinity. But before I actually press the shutter release, I go and change that to manual focus. And then it's locked in as long as I don't touch that ring because this is not like the Starry Sky. If I'm afraid that I'm going to move the ring, I'll do it again. Or you could tape the ring if you wanted to. But that's a neat little trick if you happen to have the fisheye lens. I think it's the only lens that that works with, though. All right. So all of the stars have aligned. Pardon the pun. We've got the Milky Way out, the moon isn't competing with us. We're in a dark sky area. Um, the sky is clear. We are absolutely ready to shoot. And now comes the most important thing, composition, right? You wanna make your image stand out. Nobody ever looks at a great photograph and says, wow, what amazing settings you've got, right? They look at the composition and they say, that's a really cool image. The settings they might ask afterwards, but they it's the composition that will make your image stand out, all right? Now, I'll be the first to admit that sometimes you just want to uh, photograph the Milky Way on its own. And, you know, I still do that years later after shooting, you know, a couple of times a year, I just want to get a really nice shot of the Milky Way because it is cool. But after that, you got to bump it up a notch and you got to make your images a little bit more interesting, right? I view photographing the night sky the same way I view photographing um, a, uh, a sunset. The colors may be really cool, but it's what you put in front of them that are going to make the difference. And so we want to have something interesting in the foreground. And I'm going to look at four different kinds of shooting situations. And for each one of them, it's all really about the light. Astrophotographers are a weird bunch. We expend all this energy trying to get to dark sky areas. And what do we do? We light up the foreground. So I'm going to look at four different ways of doing that. And a couple of them actually don't really involve light at all. Uh, the first one, I don't want to add any additional light. I'm just going to use the ambient light that's there. And this 
photograph that you see right now um, is a perfect example of that. I didn't add any additional lighting to it. I am just using the light that Mother Nature is giving to me. All right. Uh, so it's, you know, star bright, star bright, and the but that's all, folks. Um, and this is a really good way to start shooting. If you're just getting into astrophotography, I did this for a couple of years before I really started doing any other additional lighting. I'm just looking for interesting silhouettes. So, you know, everybody can tell that this is a hydro line. Um, you know, I did shoot this a few years ago. This was with the EM-1 and I got lucky. I got a meteor strike going through, right? If I'm doing this kind of shooting, I definitely want to try to find a silhouette that's obvious, right? Um, so found this old barn, um, you know, a, a silhouetted fence. And then my job was to create a composition out of that and got the Milky Way arcing over top of them, right? And it's a simple composition, but I still like these kind. Here is an old farmhouse. Again, you can see the fence. The Milky Way definitely dominates the, uh, the uh, image, right? I live on an island. I've got lots of lakes here in Northern Ontario that I can photograph. And so I regularly just want a silhouetted shoreline with a bit of a reflection. So I like going out when, you know, I've got these really calm conditions. Um, I like to frame my images as well. And so here I've got uh, these cattails framing it and, you know, use the fisheye lens with the Milky Way streaming through the sky. Here's another frame shot. Uh, we have the Niagara Escarpment running through our island. Everybody knows Niagara Falls. Well, the same uh, set of cliffs we've got here. And so I just climbed under a cliff here, got a silhouette. Um, these are good shots, uh, but they are a little flat. The instant, you know, you're just using the ambient light and the uh, a silhouette, most of the time the uh, images look a little flat. But that doesn't mean you can't use um, some artificial light that might already be present. And that was the case here. So I found this stretch of highway that lined up perfectly with the Milky Way as I was driving around and I got out and of course I've got a street light over my left shoulder. Well, I moved up the highway a little bit so it wasn't overpowering the shot um, and I still got a pretty good image out of it. So I can use some available artificial light. Here's something, you know, you might not typically think you would want to do. I've got this porch light streaming right into the lens um, and it still worked. Um, here's the, here's one of the few shots where I actually used uh, focus bracketing. So I'm going to kind of diverge from lighting here for just a moment. Um, most of the time I try to make sure that my foreground is beyond sort of infinity uh, for my lens. Here was a case where that wasn't it. Um, I took the first shot, set at infinity, and then I manually focused on the closest part of the fence, took a shot of it, and then stacked these two in Photoshop uh, to create a single image. But I don't do a lot of focus stacking. I do a lot of that in my landscape, but not in my astro. All right, here's another shot, and I had lots of uh, artificial light here. This is a small island just off the shore where the ferry comes to where I live. And so this is, um, this is all being illuminated by a parking lot, as is this range light. So you can still get some pretty decent dark sky shots, even if you're you know, not really in a dark sky area, as long as you're not in a big city. Um, here I'm in a town of about 2,000 people in these old ruins, and um, yeah, I could still see lots of stars. All right. Now, after you've done a little bit of that ambient lighting stuff, um, it is kind of nice to light it up and add some dimension to your shots with some simple light painting. I typically use, uh, for light painting, I don't, I'm not talking about, you know, using these fancy wands and that kind of thing. I'm just talking about your headlamp. We're all carrying around a flashlight or a headlamp anyway, so why not use it to light up your foreground, right? As I, here I kind of did a little bit of a selfie with that, but of course in most of the time when I'm doing this, I'm actually waving the light in front of my subject. You'll remember this shot from a few uh, slides ago. I went back on another occasion with this old farmhouse and then used my headlamp to light it up. Now, it is the simplest form of light, but it does have a degree of complexity to it because it can be a little challenging to actually get it lit up the way you want it to. Um, 
you know, most headlamps only have one or two settings. Some might have a three in term for dim, how dim it gets. So this was on the dimmest setting, but it wasn't for the entire exposure. You can see that this was a 20 second exposure. I probably waved this in front of um, the uh, my foreground here for maybe five or six seconds. Um, probably didn't get it the first time. I probably had to do it a few times before I got it right. And that is the challenge of doing um, a light painting with your headlamp. But it is a, a fairly simple and very inexpensive method because you probably are carrying one anyway because you're walking around in the dark. Right Here's one that was a little bit more complicated. I had to hang a light inside this old farmhouse and then uh, went outside and did a little bit of light painting on the exterior. Now, I don't light paint anymore, to be honest. I have come up, not I have come up with, but I've discovered another technique that most astral landscape photographers are using, and that is low-level lighting, all right? And low-level lighting has become sort of the main way of um, lighting up your foreground because there are so many, LED lights have come a long way in the last few years. There are a lot of cheap alternatives of lights that can dim. And so um, here I'm going to go through a few examples and then I'm going to stop for a second and show you some of the, the lights that I use. But here's one of the lights, the uh, images that I took last year. I'm standing on a riverbank on one side and I'm illuminating the other side with an LED light that is quite dim and it's on for the full 20 seconds so I get nice even lighting and lighting that can be repeated. There are a whole bunch of lights out there, loom cubes and bio lights and you know other lights that are out there, but I thought for this I'm just going to show you um, lights that I've illuminated with it, one that you're carrying with you anyway. I used my phone for this, but not the flashlight that's attached to my phone, the actual screen of my phone. And so these next few are all with that. Um, here's one where I lit up this fence post. I'm standing maybe 10 feet away, and it is my phone that is illuminating this uh, fence post, not any other kind of light, not my headlamp or anything else. Right? Here's the... Uh, the last trip that I took before the pandemic, this was in Colorado in Great Sand Dunes National Park. I'm standing 50 feet away from the camera and I'm holding my phone down low, maybe six inches, maybe a foot above the sand so that I would get the pronounced ripples uh, of sand and uh, just left this on while it was shooting. Um, and that's it's amazing how well that light can illuminate a fairly large area, right? In this case, I had enough light for uh, to light up the uh, snow and the ice in this shot. I just used my phone to illuminate the tree to add some dimension to that tree. And again, that's just my phone. This was the very first shot that I ever took uh, lighting up my, uh, doing some low level lighting with my phone. We get, these really cool ice features on the south shore of the island that I live on uh, during particularly cold winters. We didn't have them this year, but last or two years ago, we had an amazingly cold winter and we got these really cool uh, uh, ice features forming, these kind of ice cliffs. And this ice monster, as I call him, was about 30 to 40 feet tall, but without any light on it, you couldn't see any of the details. So I just turned on my phone, used a flashlight app that I've got and illuminated it. And it turned out really, really well. So what is this app that I'm using? It's just called Screen Flashlight. I'm an Android phone user, even though I'm on a Mac computer. Um, it's free. You may not be able to find exactly this one. That doesn't matter. What you want to look for are two key features. Um, number one, you want to have something that dims. You need a light that will dim, and it needs to dim quite low. You don't need a lot of light, especially if you're fairly close to your subject. The other thing that is a nice feature to have is the ability to control the lighting, to select the color. Um, I often will just use white light, but sometimes I do want to add a little bit of a color cast to it, um, and so that allows me to do it. It's a great little app. Um, and you know they've got it for iOS and for Android. All right, I wanna 
show you an example of a, a recent um, low-level lighting situation that I did a little over a month ago. Uh, we just kind of finished winter here, and we have this waterfalls that goes over the escarpment. Every year it freezes um, pretty solid, and this year it formed this really cool look to it. And so I went during the day, and I took this landscape shot. And after taking this shot, I walked kind of around onto the ice and then climbed in behind the waterfall. And this is what it looks like behind. It's an overhanging fall, so you can easily walk behind it. And you'll notice that the even though the ice is pretty thick, um, the sunlight was definitely being transmitted through it, and that is the natural color of the ice, that kind of cool green color. Well, I thought, if the sunlight can be transmitted through it, maybe I can put some lights back here and transmit it in the other direction and photograph it. So I went back that night after the sun had set, um, set up two lights on poles here, two um, low-level lights, and then I went out and began photographing it. And so here's what it looks like from the outside. Um, I've got two lights illuminating the falls themselves. And then I used my phone again to illuminate the foreground. Right? Then I moved to another position, same lights behind the waterfalls, and used my phone to photograph this pillar, which is probably 40, 50 feet high. Um, and then I took one more shot where I wanted to get in a little close. Um, and uh, no sky in this case, but uh, it included myself to give you a sense of scale there. Um, and it, these photos actually kind of went viral. Um, but you can do all sorts of cool lighting with your shots. All right. I want to now um, show you some of those lights. So, Michelle, if you can just uh, move to me. Um, when I first uh, started doing some low level lighting. I really didn't know what I was doing. And so I, I had a couple of these um, video lights, right? A lot of people would be familiar with these video lights. And, you know, they become quite bright. They're not meant really for, for nighttime shooting. I hope I'm not blinding you here. And they do dim, but they don't dim very much. This is still way too bright for most situations at night, right? Um, I also have a bio light and uh, that dims down fairly well. Uh, these guys make camping gear, and so I used one of my camping lights. Um, and uh, the neat thing about this is it's got a solar panel at the back, so you can just charge it during the day, and you can even charge your phone with it, so a bio light will work. A lot of people would be familiar with loom cubes, and so this is my little loom cube uh, panel light, and that's at 1%, and that's as dim as it gets, right? At 100%, it's pretty bright. Now, for where I live, I'm often in sort of kind of closer quarters. I'm not shooting in the Southwest like Arches, Par Arches National Park where I can be a fair distance from my subject. I find that even at 1%, um, that's too bright. And so I've kind of had to come up with a hack for it. And so I just get some landscape fabric. I'm a bit of a gardener as well. And so I bring along a little bit of landscape fabric with me. And because it's kind of translucent and neutral in color, I can wrap it around as many times as I want and darken it if I need to. Um, and so, you know, these lights can work, but really quickly, because I don't want to spend too much time on this. I know we've got only got an hour. Um, the phone app. So I'm gonna, just going to turn on my phone here for a second. And so here's the app, and this is on uh, the brightest setting. And so once I press this to start it, that's what the screen looks like. It is just a screen, and that's on its brightest, and that is way too bright for most situations. I have to dim it almost all the way down, and that's on dim. And I'm willing to bet that you can barely see that that's on. But during a longer exposure, if I'm only 10 feet away from my subject, that's all I need. I don't need it very bright at all. All right, so let's continue on here. So Michelle, if you can get away from my mug, um, let's now look at the fourth method. And this is something that I have just started doing. I started this almost a year ago to the day. 
um, these things called time blends, where you are taking a bunch of shots over longer periods of time and merging them into one shot. And again, this is not um, something that I invented. Lots of astrophotographers are doing it. But now that I've started doing it, I absolutely love doing it. And you get some really cool results. So like I said, a year ago, I started doing this. And so this shot was taken on April 20th, 2020. So a year and two days ago. And this is what the night sky looked like at 2.22 in the morning. And I was actually using the time-lapse feature uh, on my camera. So I'd set up this, was taking a series of time-lapse images. Um, by four in the morning, the sky looked like this. And you can see that the image didn't move. So I've got my fisheye lens on, tripod is nice and solid. Um, the Milky Way is now moving its way out of the frame and we are definitely into the blue hour. Then I kind of stopped the time lapse because the light was changing so quickly, made a few settings changes and stuck around to photograph dawn. And we just happened to get some, a little bit of color uh, not the best sunrise I've ever seen, but a little bit of color on the horizon. And then I took those three images, did a little bit of post-processing with them, and blended them together to create this time blend, right? It is a very surreal image. You could never see something like this in a single shot. It's several hours of shooting. Um, and then I uh, straightened it, right? I did some correction. And I'm going to show you that live in a few minutes. Um, but after doing that, I kind of fell in love with this form of, of astrophotography. Um, I went back, I think, two or three days later, almost in the same spot. You can see that this kind of looks like the sa a similar composition. This time, I included the sunburst in here. Um, and so this, this kind of shooting does require a bit of a time commitment, though. This is not quick and dirty stuff. Your camera is stuck there for several hours uh, if you're going to do a shot like this. Here's one that I did last August. Um, like most astrophotographers, I definitely wanted to capture a shot of Neowise. Um, and I got many sort of single shots of it. But I also wanted to create a blend of both Neowise and the Milky Way. The problem is both of these were kind of at opposite ends of the sky. Um, and so I needed to do a, a time blend to do this. So I shot the Neowise uh, portion of this shot at, I think, around 10 o'clock at night, maybe 11. Um, and then I had to wait and wait and wait. And at around 2 in the morning, the Milky Way moved into the into the screen. And in between those two, I actually caught a meteor strike. Then I also stuck around at dawn and photographed um, a little bit of dawn light so you could catch a little bit of detail in the tree. So this is four images all then blended together. Right. Here's one that I did in March this year. So just a, about a month ago as the ice was melting on the bay here. Right. And this one I just did this last weekend, and I love the way this one turned out. And again, you know, a bit of time commitment, um, but being able to include, you know, the three periods of time, including dawn, allowed me to see a little bit of the rock in the water, which would be very difficult to, to photograph um, with just a nighttime shot. Right. Now, you don't have to do, um, oh, there's one more that involves multiple shots. Right. So this was, again, one that I did last year. Um, and in this case, I actually included a live comp image. So there's actually four shots here, the Milky Way, a little bit of blue hour, the sunrise, and then the live comp. But this was a little bit more challenging than I thought it might be because at around, I think, maybe three in the morning when I did the live comp, there was absolutely no traffic on the highway. This was a stretch of highway that nobody travels on at night. Um, and so I had to go and drive it myself. So I had to leave the camera there, drive this stretch of highway, then turn around and come back. Uh, but it is what we do for our art. All right. Um, here's a, a time blend that was not nearly as involved. This was just two shots, you know, maybe separated by a half an hour of time. And uh, so... The Milky Way was shot, I think, this past weekend at around 4.30 in the morning. And then I just had to wait for a little bit of the blue hour. And uh, 
got the, the little bit of a boardwalk, this path that you see, and then blended those two images. So not nearly the same amount of uh, time commitment as the other shots that you saw. Here's one um, of the uh, of some daisies last July when they're out on the fields here. And then I waited for the Milky Way to appear because it would be very difficult to light up that big of a field with a nice even light, right? Here's one that I just did uh, um, again about a month ago, um, two shots. And then um, once I posted this, uh, a public art gallery got in touch with me and they purchased an enlargement of this. So don't let anyone ever tell you that a micro four thirds lens can't be enlarged. That is, I think, 28 by 32. And it's going to be in the permanent collection of, a, of an art gallery here in Ontario. All right. Um, the last thing that I want to talk about before we do the live thing, and I probably need to speed things up here a bit, is a process that a lot of astrophotographers are doing in order to get rid of some of the noise. The instant you use higher ISOs, you're going to get some noise. So we use image stacking. And I'm gonna talk about some third party software that I use. You can use Photoshop to image stack. And it's a, a process that you can use for any kinds of photographs. You take a whole bunch of photographs, you layer them on top of each other, and then you use a blend mode or you, you use a median uh, kind of blend mode to average the noise out and it really does a nice job of cleaning things up. But I don't use Photoshop for that, I use a different package. All right, the first thing though you have to do is take your series of images. So instead of taking a single shot, which is what I'm set for here, I use the custom timer. And so I enter the custom timer and that allows me now to program a set number of shots and let me enlarge that here for a second. So at the moment, I've got a one second delay. I can change that if I want. And I am shooting 10 shots in a row. Now there is a limit with the custom timer. 10 is the most that you can take. If you wanna take more than 10 shots for your stack, you would have to either press it again after your 10 are done, or you know do the, you know one after the other, which gets a little tedious or use time-lapse, but I find 10 shots usually works really well. And then I have a half second interval, which is the shortest interval. So those are the settings that I use, and then I'm ready to shoot my stack. So here's a situation, you've seen this old farmhouse before. Um, I want to, I'm gonna show you the 10 shots, um, and I want you to notice three things that are going on. So here we go, here are the 10 shots. All right, those were the 10 images. And I hope you noticed three things. Number one, the lighting on the building didn't change. And that's where low level lighting comes in handy. If I was trying to light paint this, that would be a lot more difficult to do. So low level lighting really works. The other thing you would have noticed is that of course the sky is moving through the image and you may have seen a satellite go by. Image stacking is going to improve all of those things. So. Um, I use a program called Starry Landscape Stacker for the Mac. It's got a price of 39, 40 bucks US. Um, there is a free version if you're a Windows user called Sequitur. And so I'm gonna go into uh, Starry Landscape Stacker here, show you a couple of screenshots. Once I've imported these into Starry Landscape Stacker, this is what the image looks like. Kind of looks a little bizarre. My image suddenly has the measles. Um, and you will notice if you can look past the measles, the Milky Way is all blurry. You can see star trails. The foreground though is still is still still. Um, what it does is it will mask that. Once you've identified you know, most of the stars and it does most of them for you, um, it will mask that. And then its job, once you sort of press the start button, is to realign the Milky Way and keep the foreground stationary. And then you get a shot that looks like this. So this is the stacked image and you should have noticed some differences already. Let's do a sort of a side by side or up down comparison. So there is the single shot at the top. There's the stacked image. And although I did do a little bit of post-processing on these just so that they show up a little clearer here today, I did exactly the same post-processing. So there's no difference in post. Let's zoom in a little closer. Notice the noise on the left and almost no noise on the right. But just as important as that, 
the tonal range range is improved in the stacked image. It has got a higher dynamic range in the um, stacked image. And that is also a consequence of the stacking. So it's a great image. It's a great process to do. But again, it involves a little bit more time because now you're shooting instead of one shot, you're shooting 10 or 20 shots. And you've got a, an extra step for post. But I find it, it worth it. All right. Let's review. Uh, everything that I've sort of talked about, you certainly don't have to do all of it. You can choose your own astrophotography adventure. And the first thing that I talked about was just using ambient light. I certainly still do that with a number of my images. If you want to get into lighting up your scene, the easiest thing is light painting, right? There's low level lighting, which I encourage you to try if you've never done it before, especially considering you can download this app. And if you have lots of time to kill, try doing some of those time blends if you're fairly comfortable in Photoshop. And with all of those, you can image stack. Again, the light painting will be a little difficult to you know, get uniform lighting, but image stacking can work. All right, now it's time to do some post-processing. Um, you know, People do ask, do you Photoshop your work? Well, yes, but I actually do a lot more um, Lightrooming. So I'm now going to go to Lightroom. So if Michelle, you can uh, switch to me while I do a switch over to um, Lightroom. So I need to do a little bit of finagling here behind the scenes while I share that desktop here. So here we go. My entire it's screen. It's looking good. Okay. This has been great, Peter. I'm just waiting for you to pop it up. And can I just say, I'm so unbelievably jealous of where you live. I did not realize how gorgeous it was. Oh, thanks. thanks. Can I come visit? Is that okay? Anytime. <laughs> anytime. I have a couple of guest rooms. Uh, but I think we all have to wait to COVID because I want to do some um, uh, visiting myself. I can't wait to get back to Colorado to visit my son that's there. Okay. So let me share this now. And oops, hold it a second. I think I have shared. I just got to get into Lightroom. Okay, so you should be seeing Lightroom. Is that a thumbs up, Michelle? We got it. We are All good right, to go for this go. live edit. So in order to do this live edit, um, you know, things may get bogged down because there's a lot of data being streamed upwards. So hopefully this works really well. And I've also had to kind of change my screen resolution. If you're not familiar with Lightroom, here's the Reader's Digest condensed version. Um, it's got a library module here, which is where you would import your photographs and uh, you can catalog them, you can organize them and give keywords and so on to them. I'm not really gonna mess around with that right now. I'm in the develop module here. Um, over on my right, these are all the tools. If you've never used Lightroom, chances are you've done some post-processing and almost every package that you use has similar types of tools. So this shouldn't be completely foreign to you. All right, so on the bottom, bottom, bottom on the bottom is my uh, import. So I've imported a series of images and I've got the first one selected here. And now I'm going to go into um, my uh, develop tools here. And I'm just going to zoom in here a little bit so this gets a little bit bigger for you. And the first thing that I would do is I would go to the exposure uh, slider. And I'm just going to bump this up about one stop. All right, so there we go. There's one stop. And that already makes a difference. Now, I want to bring the highlights out a little bit more. So I'm going to pop that up. Uh, let's say there. There is no hard and fast I experiment drag up, drag down a little bit. <clears throat> All right. And then I'm going to go to my favorite tool. I'm sort of just going to work down. I'm not going to bounce around too much here. I'm not going to worry about the whites and the blacks and the texture and the clarity, but I am going to stop at the dehaze tool. I don't use the dehaze dur much during my um, landscape shooting, but you will notice that the sky is a little flat here. Well, let's add some uh, contrast here, and the dehaze tool is perfect for that. So I'm going to slide the dehaze up a fair amount. So I'm going to go to about 40 or 50 here, and you will notice a fair amount of contrast already here. Space is now darker. The cloud of the Milky Way has brightened up a bit. <clears throat> Excuse me. Right. I might want to make this pop a little bit, so I'm going to go to the uh, Vibrance. I don't need too much color, and I might adjust that later. And I do like playing with the tone curve a little. 
right? You can see what my histogram is. You know, we can't expose to the right when we're um, shooting at night, but we can try to keep it away from the left. So I'm gonna add a little bit of a tone curve. I don't think I need to bring it down too much of an S. No, I kind of keep it as a nice gradual curve there. The only other thing that I might do, I'm finding this a little warm. Uh, so I'm gonna go to my white balance. Normally I like a 3800. And so you can see that I'm at 4000 Kelvin here. And like I said before, you can adjust your white balance. So I'm gonna bring that to um, about 3800. There, that's close enough, right? And if this was just a single shot with a regular silhouette kind of thing like I've got here, that's about all I would do. I don't spend a lot of time on the post-processing. Bit of an exposure, highlights, dehaze, you know, that kind of thing. Because I've got a reflection here, I am going to do one other uh, adjustment, and that is using the graduated filter. These three tools can be very helpful for doing sort of localized adjustments. So I go to the... Uh, graduated filter, all right? I'm gonna go on to my um, image here and I'm going to add a, a very slight graduated filter along the horizon and then I'm going to brighten the water, all right? I don't want it too bright and I want I don't want this orange, this glow from a, a neighboring town to be up there too much. So I'm going to now drag this. I want. I don't want that glow to be getting much brighter. So I'm going to just widen this um, this graduation. All right, and I like that. I don't think I need to mess around with that too much. No, I certainly don't want to do that. Uh, so I think around 50 is good. All right, and I could play with some other things, but I like that. So I'm going to click done. And I'm going to zoom back out again so you can see the whole screen. And I'll give you a moment for that to catch up because I know that can cause a bit of a delay when I do that zooming in and out. All right. Again, if you're not familiar with Lightroom, everything that you've just done, everything I've just done has been saved as a record here. This is like it's history. And I can go back and forth. If I don't like something, I can go back and change it. The cool thing about Lightroom is it is totally non-destructive. None of these changes have actually affected my photograph. It is totally non-destructive. I can go back five years from now and try to change this again. Let's say Lightroom comes up with some updates and so on that I want to do that uh, that I want to make. I can go back. Nothing's been actually permanently changed unless I export this. All right. The other thing I'll briefly mention is that once I've made these kinds of setting changes, I can go to develop and I can create a new preset. So the next time I just have to type in, I can type in Astro here, I kind of got to work around my microphone, um, but I can go Astro, let's say number two, because I've got another one already, hit create, and it becomes one of my presets right there, okay? Um, and so that's pretty much all of the uh, post-processing that I would do with this shot. Now, I told you before that I stack most of my images. So now here is the stack. I want to apply this to all of these. So I'm going to go to the last image here. I'm going to hold the shift key down, select all of these. I'm going to sync all of these. Here they go, all syncing. All right, now they've all been sunk, if that's the proper verb. Um, and there we go. They've, they all now have all of those settings applied to them. Before, um, before I can, hold it, my phone just rang, so I gotta stop that, my apologies. Um, before I can actually do anything with these in Starry Landscape Stacker, I need to export them. So I'm gonna right mouse click, go to export, all right? And the key here is that they have to be exported as TIFF. So I'm dropping them in a made up folder for this demo, but the important thing is here that they're TIFFs. Starry Landscape Stacker wants TIFFs. So I would go export, but I'm gonna cancel that because I've already done it because exporting takes a moment. And so now let me go to the exported one. So here they all are exported from a previous, I already set this up. And now let me go into Starry Landscape Stacker. So boom, start up Starry Landscape Stacker. Here it is. It automatically wants to know which images that I uh, want to um, have it open. So I'm going to go to those exported shots. I've got a couple of other ones here to show you afterwards, but those are the 12 images. I go open and here they go. 
I feel like I'm on a cooking show. This is the live cooking show. Okay, so everybody get your frying pan hot enough and saute those onions. Um, okay, so here we are. Here is the stacked image. And again, here's that disease that we've got. Um, it's all been, it, it, it identifies most of the stars, but certainly not all of them. And you will notice that it also has identified the stars in the reflection. Now, I wanna try to make sure that the mask that it creates is as accurate as possible. So I'm gonna try to fill in areas where perhaps there are some stars missing, especially along the tree line. I don't wanna to touch any of the trees because when it actually begins to realign stuff, I don't want any of these trees to move and create a blur. Um, so I'm just gonna fill in here and hope that it creates the best mask that, I can, that it can. I'm also gonna draw a dotted line all the way along the horizon here. I'm gonna do the same thing in the reflection, try not to mess things up. All right, so there we go. Get in here, get in here. All right, and kind of doing this a little rushed because uh, I realize I'm looking at the time. We're already overdue. If you have to go, I apologize. Um, and so you can erase dots, add more red dots, but now it's time to find the sky. So I click find sky, it's computing the mask and boom, there it is. And it did a pretty good job, but you see that there are some areas that it missed. And so all I'm gonna do is brush those in. All right, I want the reflection here. And this area here where I know that I've got some reflected stars. All right, so there we go. There's my mask. Some images are a little bit more complicated than this one. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I chose this one, but I'm happy with that mask. I now go align and composite, and now it's aligning all of those images. And again, this takes a moment, but it's pretty fast. And so we're just gonna, uh, this is, finishes this up. Um, I have done this in Photoshop because you can do it manually, but I've never been happy with the results that I've gotten. And so I highly recommend this program. I've never used Sequitur because I don't have a Windows machine. Okay, here we go. There is the composited image. Now let me zoom in to the actual pixels here and hopefully you can see these and let me slide over to the actual milky way and a little bit of the tree line here but i want most of the milky way so this is at 100 percent zoom and now i want to show you a comparison all right so here's the composite and here there we go this is one of the original shots all right, and you should have been able to see a huge noise. I know that you're not seeing it necessarily as clearly as I am. That is the original, um, and you'll notice that there was a satellite going through, and there is the composite, right? What a difference. All right, let me now get out of Starry Landscape st Stacker. What I would do then here is save this, all right? So I would hit save, save the file, which I've already done. So I'm actually gonna exit Starry Landscape uh, stacker, just in case that's uh, causing some issues. And I just want to go in here and while I'm in Lightroom, show that um, side by side, huge difference. Stacking really works. And I don't care if you're using full frame or not, even full frame cameras create digital noise. All right, the last thing that I want to look at is Photoshop. All right, well, let me just go back here for a second. All right, I wanna look at the time blending because if you're at all interested in time blending, it is really cool to look at. Okay, so let me zoom back out. Here are those three shots. All right, so this one was shot at, you know, 2.20 at 4 a.m. and this one was shot right at sort of dawn. Um, but each of these two, the first two, this one and this one are stacked images already. I took 10 shots, stacked them to create this, to clean up the noise. I took 10 shots here, stacked those to create the noise. These were both shot at ISO 3200, but by the time I got to dawn, I was shooting at ISO 200, and so this is a lot cleaner image. I would then select these, right mouse click, and edit open as layers in Photoshop, all right? And so, I've already done that, again, to speed things up. Again, like a cooking show, all for the same recipe. Uh, let me get to Photoshop here. And so now what I've got are these three layers that have been 
uh, imported into Photoshop. And I want you to notice the order of these layers. I've got dawn at the bottom, then twilight on top of it, and the Milky Way on top top of it. I'm going to turn off the Milky Way, turn off the eyeball here. I'm going to go to twilight and maybe turn that off for a second. The only part of dawn that I want to show through in this image is the, um, the color of dawn here, the color of the sunrise. But I also want some of the details in the rock. I like the depth in the water that you can get uh, here and maybe a few of the highlights in the tree. Everything else I don't want. So I'm going to go to twilight have that open, select that layer, and I'm going to add a layer mask. My apologies if you don't know layer masking, but layer masking is an amazing feature in Photoshop that allows me to cut a hole in this layer so that I can see the layer below it. I'm going to choose my brush, all right, and black cuts the hole, white um, repairs the hole. So here's my brush, and that is way bigger than I want it to. So I'm going to shrink this br brush using the um, uh, left bracket key, and I've got an opacity of 100%, which I don't want to work with. I'm going to choose 30% by pressing the number three, and I'm going to begin cutting this. And I'm hoping you're seeing this sort of as ex exactly as I'm doing this. So I'm now cutting a hole into this um, picture. You can see, whoop, if I zoom in a little bit, uh, you can see the hole is right there. Let me zoom back out again. Um, and I'm beginning to show the color. That's all I want. I do not want any of this bright part up here. That's kind of a putrid color. Um, so I want as much of that red. So I'm just brushing over it a bit more. I'm going to now enlarge this brush in uh, some of the detail in the rocks in the water. Here we go. I'm seeing the rocks show up, maybe a little bit of the shoreline. And I'm going to speed this up a little bit. It won't be perfect, but you can hopefully see that on the monitor that you're using. And again, as Michelle said, this is going to look a lot better on a larger monitor than on a phone. All right, there we go. There's the layer mask for Twilight. I might come back and play with it a little bit more. Uh, go to the Milky Way. And in this case, click that, file, that layer, hit the layer mask. Um, I want a lot more uh, of this one revealed. And so... I'm going to get a little bit of the blue hour here, and I'm just kind of haphazard brushing here, uh, trying to create uh, a fairly consistent and fairly nice transition. All right, I hope you get the idea here um, of how that works, right? It's just a matter of experimenting with layer masking, brushing in, brushing out, and you can see the layer masks here. Let me actually show you a final copy that I worked on. All right, so here is the final copy in this folder. Um, and then what I did is after I kind of did all of the layer masking, I also then played with a few adjustment layers. So I added a curves, which helped to brighten the whole thing. I wanted the rocks in the foreground to be even brighter, so I added another curves but, and uh, masked out some of it so that I can see the rocks and then made a little bit of the vibrance thing happen. Um, and now here's the last thing that I wanna talk about. I get this question all the time because I use the fisheye lens a fair amount. People ask me quite regularly, how do I correct the fisheye, right? Cause you can definitely see a curve in the horizon. I do not use the built-in correction in the camera because that creates a JPEG. And I don't use any of the lens profiles in Lightroom, those can work. I use a really simple cheat, and I'm sure other people use this too, but I've never met anybody who uses it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all of these layers that are part of this image, all right, and I'm going to make a copy of them, and then I'm going to merge them to create a single layer. Boom, there we go. Here is the single layer, right? Now I can work on this. And I'm going to go to Edit, Transform, and Warp. Time to go and do some warp. It's a warped mind anyway. All right, so I'm going to use the Move tool here. And now, I don't know if you've ever used the Warp tool, but it does allow me to sort of do some really interesting twisting and turning. First thing I want to know is that I'm going to get a straight horizon line. So I'm going to drag a guide from the ruler here. Uh, maybe that's a little too high. Let's move it down here. Uh, maybe there. All right. 
Now I'm going to grab this and I'm just literally going to drag. Oh, what am I doing here? Oh, maybe I lost my warp. Okay, let me go back here for a second. Edit, transform, warp. There we go. I see the handles now. All right, here we go. Now I'm warping. You can see the only part of this image that is moving is the horizon, right? I mean, I could go completely nuts with this if I wanted to, which I'm not, although I kind of like that. Looks really cool when you do this to faces. Um, all right, so there we go. I've kind of straightened out the horizon. The edges here are still a little uh, curved upwards. So I'm going to draw, drag this handle down, try to straighten it, all right? And I don't need to do as much over here because you can't really tell what the horizon was doing. I could also, if you don't like the fact that the trees are kind of curved in a little bit, you could mess with that. All right, I'm just going to stop there. Um, then I hit the check mark, click OK. All right, get rid of this guideline. And there's my final image ready to be saved as a JPEG or whatever I want to do. Whew. All right, there we are. Um, and that's the way that I would correct most of my images. I find I don't destroy, you know, like the corners stay pretty clean and everything. Um, that seems to work really well. All right. I think I am done. So I'm going to now stop sharing this. I think I've already done That was done amazing. Yeah. That was amazing. Peter, Ooh. that was so great. Okay, I'm going right. to bring up some of our comments. I learned so much about editing just from that. <laughs> that was awesome. Uh, we've had a couple of questions come through. Let me just drop this out so we can look at the uh, questions. A lot of people want to know if you um, do any in-camera stacking in any way, which I know. Uh, I do use the focus stacking when it comes to landscape photography. I use that a lot. And I've even got a, uh, an article on the um, Learn Center about focus stacking in uh, landscape photography, but I don't do any in-camera stacking at, at night. Um, I don't even think you can. Um, you know, maybe you could focus stack, but I never tried that at night. It just seems like a really difficult process. Um, so no, I don't. Not in camera, I do all the stacking here. Awesome, and this one got brought up and the only reason I'm putting it on here is because I know you and I talked about time-lapse, but somebody would like to know if you use an intervalometer or the time-lapse feature in your camera and do night sky time-lapse. Yes, I do a lot of time-lapses. If we had a bit more time, I could cover a little bit of that. Um, but yes, I do use the built-in intervalometer. It has every control that you want. Um, it's very easy to program. As a matter of fact, that um, that blended scene that I just worked on, the camera started shooting at, I think, around midnight. I set the camera up at 9 o'clock that night, and I went home to bed. And I used the <laughs> – yep, I just left the camera sitting there. I knew nobody would find it, um, and I just let it shoot all night long. Then I went back at around 4.30 in the morning so I could still catch dawn. It shot, it, it turned on at midnight. It shot all night long. I then turned it off at around, like I said, you know, 4.30 or so and took the dawn shots. Um, and yeah, so time-lapse can be a really useful tool. Uh, I've done it with the Aurora. I've done it with the Milky Way, all sorts of things. That's awesome. That actually brings me to another question. I can't find it in the comments to pop it on the screen, but somebody was asking how far you push the limits in cold weather with your Olympus camera past what our weather sealed guarantee might be. Oh, much further. I push it. Uh, it, it can handle it better than I can most of the time. So I have been, <laughs> I have been out in minus 30 for two or three hours shooting. Um, and after three hours, the prob the battery probably needs to be changed, but I've also got a battery grip that I can add, and I don't think I've ever run out of two batteries at minus 30. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, but I've definitely pushed it past, I think the guarantee is minus 10. I'm mm -hmm. regularly past minus 10 all the time. It's Northern Ontario. Right. I know. As soon as I saw that comment come up, I was like, did you see where he lives, though? I It's very cold. Yeah. 
that that that's where I draw the line. I'm I, I can't be that cold. Even with like a big jacket, I would give up. So I'm very impressed by your ability to go freeze your buns off out there under waterfalls. <laughs> right on. So somebody also asked if you've ever tried high res mode combined with a tracker. Um, I know that you said at the beginning that you don't use trackers, but right. do you have a reason why you don't or just because it's easier? And um, I just, I don't feel the need to. I'm not, I'm not, people often ask, do you do deep sky stuff? That's, that's not who I am. I have a great deal of admiration for the people who do the deep sky stuff. And I don't, I know you don't need a tracker for that. Um, but I've just never felt the need for it. So I don't use it. Um, and so no, I don't uh, track. And so the, it is an interesting question. Could you track and use high res mode? Is an if, if you could, that might be a good reason to get one because you cannot use high res mode for regular night sky shooting because the sensor is shifting, you know, eight times. And for each one of those times, it has to run, let's say 20 seconds by the time several minutes have gone, the stars have moved too much. You won't get a usable result, but with a tracker, I'd have to do some thinking on that one. So I have a question about your LED lighting. I'm about to pop up. How do you color correct the LED? But follow-up question that I just remembered reading earlier is everyone wanted to know if you were hand-holding your phone or if you had, uh, had it attached to the camera in some way or tripod. I've done, well, I've never attached it to the camera because I don't want the light straight on that would make it too flat. I want some dimension. So it's usually to the side. Often I am literally just holding it. All right. I just walk away from the camera because it's using the timer and I will just go and hold it like I did in the desert shot that you see there. But I also have a little clip, which I don't have sitting on my desk here. And then I put it on a small tripod and then I can uh, let it sit there. And um, but, you know, often it's just as easy to pull it out of my pocket. Um, the little flashlight will last for hours. It doesn't drain the battery. I was surprised. I can have it in my pocket for you know, an hour and the battery hardly is, has moved at all. Um, now, as far as color balancing, now, of course, a loom cube like this, it'll color, it has the option to color balance, right? So if I'm shooting at 3,800 Kelvin, I can set this to 3,800 Kelvin. With this, it doesn't. So I kind of got to do a little bit of guesswork, but mm -hmm. because I'm just, uh, because I'm post-processing the foreground separately anyway, often with those graduated filters, I can adjust that if I need to. And if it was really bad, I can make a virtual copy in Lightroom and then mm -hmm. blend those two copies together. So there are ways around it. Okay. I see. I, 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 no, no, no. I Okay, go ahead. I just got a whole bunch of questions that were the like the same. Everyone wants to, and I have answered this in the comments a whole bunch tonight, but everyone wants to know the flashlight app's name. And again, it was screen flashlight, but it appears it's, all, it's only yeah. for Android. It worst, yeah, it is the worst name for any app I've ever downloaded. It's just called screen flashlight. But again, if you can't find that one, look for a dimmer and look that you can change the colors. That's all you need, right? Um, they're all free. So if you don't like it, delete it and try another one. This was the first one that I tried and it works awesome. That's great. Thanks. Um, also we're having so many sweet comments from people that say you did a very comprehensive job that they learned a lot and there's a lot of thank yous in there. Um, awesome. and I really appreciate all the time you gave to us tonight. I know we went way over. We still have a ton of people on here. So thank everyone who hung out and stayed past our hour mark with us tonight. That's yeah, super no, thank, awesome. Yeah, thanks to all of you. Thanks for the questions. I will read through these. And if there's any that I've missed, uh, I will answer them. I did see one as I was scrolling by that made me laugh. Are you sleep deprived? You're darn right I am. <laughs> um, <laughs> especially in the spring. April hasn't been all that great here for shooting. I've only been able to get out, I think three nights. We just had too much cloud cover. Three nights we had clear skies. March though, I had, I think five or six nights in a row with, with perfect conditions. And I went ev out every single night. I was a wreck by the end of it, but I got some really good shots. 
That's amazing. I'm in bed by eight. I'm better. <laughs> I have better luck with the getting up super early and getting the shots because yeah. I'm already in bed by then. <laughs> not a lot where, you know, like if, uh, if I need to, I will go to bed at seven o'clock, set the alarm for midnight and go out. I mean, I don't care. I, I want the shot. I don't care if somebody makes fun of me saying you go to bed at seven o'clock. I will <laughs> get him the shot. I thoroughly agree. Hey, Peter, will you uh, give us, after you have that nice sip, because you deserve that, <laughs> after that long uh, presentation, can you give us a quick rundown on your photo critique that we're doing on May 6th at 5 p.m. Eastern at Home with Olympus? Absolutely. So in a couple of weeks, I'll be back. I'm really looking forward to seeing somebody else's photos instead of mine. And I'm going to go through, I'm hoping we get you know, hoping we have enough people submit that I can get through about 30 shots minimum. Um, and looking at, it, it's all about helping people uh, improve their images, right? Uh, yes, we're going to feature five of them on the website, and there is a little bit of a prize for one of them, but that's not the key. The key is to look at images and see how they could be improved, right? Photography should be a learning experience. I have absolutely no uh, secrets. And so I'm really just excited to see images and, you know, give possible suggestions. And there may be some that are so amazing that I want to reach out to you and say, well, how did you do that? Mm -hmm. right? And I hope to choose a selection of, you know, some awesome kick-ass shots and others that, yeah, it's obvious they do need some, some assistance. And so please submit. Yeah, we're really looking forward to it. Again, that's going to be in two weeks. Um, if you're new to our Home with Olympus Live, they're Thursday night lives every other Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern, usually. Sometimes we get a 6 p.m. sneaker in there. But um, we will be looking forward to seeing you again in two more weeks. And we're going to bring Peter back because uh, this, he's my. I've had a great time with you tonight. This has been awesome. I'm very excited for the photo critique. So um, we have pinned the comment on Facebook for the link to where the photo critique is and where you can submit your images. So check out the rules and everything there and start submitting your images so that we can uh, hopefully get them shared out uh, in two weeks time. And thank you, Peter. I super, super, super appreciate having you be here tonight. Oh, thank you my, so much. My pleasure. I loved it. Good, good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Thank you.